and welcome to Dialogue. With the continuing pandemic and now the war in Ukraine and its economic blowback, 2022 has already been tough on almost every country in the world. We are seeing energy crisis, inflation, and even food shortages happening all over the globe. Are we at the most dangerous point in world history, as some scholars and politicians suggest? What can we do to get back on track? With these questions in mind, today I'm speaking with Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University and the director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network to examine these critical global issues. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingdu. Welcome to the show, Professor Sachs. Here, you know, let's start with the Ukraine war, the ongoing war over there. And, and what do we have the latest is uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State uh, visited Kiev in a half secret way. And of course, uh, the message uh, seems to be like uh, the U.S. will continue to support Ukraine with the military support. And then at the same time, probably fresh uh, sanctions on Russia and they are uh, basically ready or they are looking forward to see a weakened Russia. What do you make of the visit? Well, I think the situation is extremely dangerous. What we don't have is peace negotiations. That's what we need. We have an escalation of arms. We have an escalation of rhetoric. We have an escalation of war aims. Uh, the United States uh, talking about weakening Russia, permanently isolating Russia, Biden talking about uh, Putin must leave. Uh, this is all extraordinarily dangerous. What we need is an end to the war. We need Ukraine uh, as a sovereign country with its territorial integrity, Russia to leave, and Ukraine to become a neutral country. Because uh, underpinning this war or underlying uh, this war among factors is the uh, desire of the United States to expand the NATO uh, alliance into Ukraine right up to Russia's border. And Russia warned for many, many years that this is dangerous and provocative, and it should never have been the intention of the United States. This was dangerous from the start. So we need this war to end through diplomacy. Uh, the idea of an ongoing proxy war is dangerous for every country in the world because it can escalate, get out of hand. It's especially dangerous for Ukraine because people will die in large numbers and the US backing doesn't help Ukraine in this sense, it just escalates and accelerates the destruction of the country. So I think we're on a very bad track and we need a diplomatic course instead of a military escalation. Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit more uh, analysis and, and comment on that. You know, uh, the US strategy seems to be on one hand, you have uh, you know sanctions a round after another round against Russia. And then you have this uh, continuous military support to Ukraine. Uh, are we seeing any change in terms of the mind on Russian decision makers in terms of uh, their military operation in Ukraine because of the sanctions, you know, either from the U.S. or from the European Union? The sanctions are doing damage to the Russian economy and to the whole world economy. The sanctions regime and the war are very likely to push the world economy into a general crisis, but they will not by themselves stop the war or change fundamental foreign policy or national security actions by Russia. Uh, in fact, uh, Russia continues to receive uh, large foreign exchange revenues on its exports. The prices of commodities, uh, of course, have increased worldwide. And we have a long history of uh, US sanctions, very tough sanctions on Iran or Venezuela or North Korea or other countries, not changing the course of geopolitics or a particular uh, opponent's uh, policies. So these sanctions are damaging. 
In this case, they're damaging to the entire world economy, but I think they're very unlikely to either directly degrade the Russian economy to the point where it uh, can't fight the war that it's fighting or cause Russia to change course and say, well, uh, we need to uh, 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 stop uh, because of sanctions. Indeed, strangely enough, uh, the US, because it's not negotiating with Russia, not engaging in diplomacy at all, as far as I can see, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, is giving Russia no incentive in any sense to change course, because it's even saying, well, if the war ends, the sanctions will continue because we're trying to isolate Russia, we're trying to weaken Russia. Uh, and so there's no incentive built into this for a cooperative outcome. Uh, the US is uh, engaging in a proxy war at Ukraine's expense, but also to the danger of the whole world. I do not support Russia's military operations in Ukraine, quite the opposite. But I do believe that there is a diplomatic course that urgently must be pursued, and that all countries in the world have the interest to say to Russia, to the United States, to Ukraine, sit, discuss, negotiate, stop escalating. Absolutely. And I'll speak of the danger you mentioned earlier, uh, of course, like, uh, do you think a weakened Russia, you know, as a neighbor of the European nations, uh, will that kind of Russia be safer for the European continent or even be safer for the US, uh, given the fact that Russia is uh, the largest nuclear power? And, uh, you know, right now, it seems like both sides, they do mention about, you know, we cannot rule out entirely uh, the chances or the possibility of a nuclear war even. I think that for one country to say we are out to weaken or isolate another country is an absolutely dangerous and wrong approach to politics in general. We can say we are out to stop a war. We are out to find a way to peace. We are out to find a more effective way to cooperate. We are out to find a more a way to find uh, common solutions to common problems. But for one country to say we are out to defeat the other country or to weaken or permanently isolate another country is simply to set in motion a dangerous path to general conflict. And we should not be in conflict in the world right now because we have so many dire problems that we face together, that the idea that we're directing our attention, our energies, our finances to destruction, even potentially nuclear war, is abhorrent. And so I regret the absence of diplomacy by the United States deeply, because this kind of rhetoric of enemies, alliances, dividing the world, global struggle is a wrong mindset, but it's a very powerful American mindset, I'm afraid, uh, because it comes from the idea that we need a hegemonic leader, the United States, uh, to uh, lead. And I don't believe in that. We need a cooperative approach uh, in which all countries are cooperating. I don't condone this war, but I don't condone the alliance system that the United States insists on pushing. And I don't condone a foreign policy that says we are out to weaken and isolate or defeat other countries, because this is part of our ongoing problem. My country, the United States, has been at war for decades, uh, all my life, and I'm now uh, 67 years old. It's been war by the United States in Vietnam, uh, in Laos, in Cambodia, in Nicaragua, in Iraq, Iran, Syria, uh, Libya, Yemen. It's too many wars, too much discussion about alliances, about 
defeating others, and much too little uh, sense of the common fate on the planet. So this is where we really uh, face, I think, a mindset issue that is a, a very serious problem. Well, exactly. Uh, you know, because of the Ukraine war and uh, the ensuing sanctions, uh, we are seeing the world uh, is more or less uh, being divided into different groups. You know, uh, there are countries who are with the U.S. and the European Union uh, imposing sanctions on Russia. Obviously, there are other countries who choose to be neutral. Uh, mostly developing developing world, let's say, and also if you look, you know, take a look at the fault line around the world, the global, you see also China U.S. tension. Uh, because of the tension, you know, some of the countries are under pressure to choose sides. There's also a danger of more fault lines, uh, you know, between major powers. Uh, is that the trend, or can we see, uh, or is that the danger basically uh, out there, probably for countries to work together? Uh, against such a trend, if it is a trend. I've been uh, in many countries uh, since this war began, and the sanctions are hurting uh, developing countries. In fact, they're hurting the whole world economy. Uh, the war is destabilizing the whole world economy. It's pushing up, uh, by the way, inflation in the United States as well. Uh, and this, uh, ironically, is politically costly to the Biden administration. So I don't think that the Biden administration wins any political points for what it's doing. Uh, it faces uh, electoral defeat uh, in the congressional elections uh, in November, I think, because of the rising economic tensions. But in other countries, uh, in poor African countries, the situation is becoming desperate. People cannot afford bread. People cannot afford the basic staples hunger is rising significantly there is no international plan for that indeed we could not really have an international plan to overcome the massive disruption of the war and the sanctions regime that's why i find it incredible that there isn't an intensive daily effort at the negotiating table so that we avoid the economic catastrophe. Now, this idea of ongoing conflict, uh, even the United States talking about a long war of attrition, uh, talking about these uh, expanded war aims of weakening and isolating Russia is bad news. It is part of a mentality that the United States divides the world into allies and opponents. And that mindset, uh, which I've written about uh, in uh, a book in 2019, where I called for a new foreign policy beyond American exceptionalism, is the idea that the United States needs to be the dominant power in the world. How can one country with 4% of the world population pretend or desire to be the dominant power in the world? That's a dangerous perception, and it leads to conflicts everywhere, because other countries and other regions don't want a dominant power. They want peace. They want security. They want the major countries like the US and China to be cooperating with each other, not to be uh, antagonistic. And so the US mindset that we're in some long conflict between political systems is a wrong idea. We are inextricably intertwined and interdependent on a small and very, very fragile world. We have runaway problems, not to mention uh, the uh, problems of nuclear war and conflict. We have problems of disease. We have problems of climate change. We have problems of biodiversity loss. We have problems of our environment not being safe because of increases of environmental disasters worldwide. These are issues we should be taking on together because we need cooperation to address those issues. And we're not only not doing it, we're going in the opposite direction right now.
Coming up next on Dialogue, earlier I spoke with Alexander Stubb, the former Finnish Prime Minister, to get his insight about the impact of the ongoing conflicts between Russia and Ukraine on Europe, and possible ways to solve the crisis. Stay tuned. Finland and Sweden will join NATO. It's like a sure thing. It's really an issue of timing, right? Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I, in the beginning of the conflict, I said it's not a matter of days or weeks, but months. But now I feel quite confident in saying that it's a matter of weeks. And by the latest, in the months of May, the Parliament will recommend to our government and our president that we should join NATO, and then we will file. An application, and I think Sweden will do the same thing. So when NATO has its summit、uh, in Madrid at the end of June,、uh, there will be a Finnish and Swedish NATO application, and we will join NATO by the end of this year.、Mm-hmm. Well,、uh, many says you know the much of this crisis in Ukraine has a lot to do with uh, uh, NATO's eastward expansion. You know, five times it has、uh, you know, five times of expansion. Has increased its members from a 16 to 30, with 1,000 kilometers、uh, eastward expansion, almost to the doorstep of Russia. Some people say that played a role in the Russian attacking of、uh, Ukraine.、Uh, so, what do you think of that? Well, you know, I, I think your analysis is correct, but I say that it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I actually think that for Putin, it's more about、uh, Western. Liberal democratic values than about NATO membership itself. So he did not want to see Ukraine become European. And of course, now that he attacked, Ukraine has never been more European. So on one hand, it's about NATO membership, but it's also about ideology and values. You know, the public sentiment in Finland as well as in Sweden、uh, was very much influenced by the war in Ukraine. Uh, so, speak of the impact.、Uh, you know, we, ha- we take a look at the, the war and the ensuing sanctions, in particular.、Uh, you know, what kind of uh, impact uh, they have created.、Uh, you know, not only on Russia but also on Europe.、Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, it, I mean, it's a really good question, and it, it has a big impact. I mean, and, and what people in China need to understand that what Europe and the West is doing with Russia at the moment is full and total isolation. So the instrument of war or the weapon that we have is sanctions, and that means that Russia will be politically, economically, financially, sports, culture, transport, and energy completely isolated. And the aim is not to hit the Russian people, but to hit the Russian、uh, regime. Now, then there are countries like Finland who do a lot of trade with Russia. You know, say around ten percent. A lot of our businesses have had to withdraw from Russia, and this is part of what I call the price of war、uh, or the lack of a peace dividend.、Uh, well, of course,、uh, there is、uh, seems there is no lack of a political、uh, determination, you know, on the leadership of European countries, the EU, for example, to impose sanctions、uh, on Russia, in particular in the energy sector. But then,、uh, you know, there is the issue of you know people would say. Uh, whether uh, the EU can、uh, wean itself,、uh, for example, off its dependence on Russian energy. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question, and and、uh, you know you should understand that a lot of European countries have been dependent on Russian energy, and I've said it, you know, a little bit simplifying that we've been a little bit naive because we've been dependent on American security that will continue, and that's fine, but also dependent on Russian energy. Now the transition towards a green economy will be quicker、uh, after we severe energy ties with with Russia. I'll take Finland as an example. We are dependent on Russian gas, but it's only five to seven percent of our energy portfolio, and only with the industry. So we, for instance, have used a lot of nuclear power and alternative renewable sources of of energy. Uh, but yes, I do think that eventually Europe will decouple step by step. Away from Russian energy, and of course, the country that has most energy ties with 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 Russia is Germany. But even there, we're starting to see a move 
uh, away from Russian energy for understandable reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, Stu, but th thank you for that. You know, obviously, also the impact uh, is not limited in the energy sector. I mean, uh, in terms of like the public, uh, the people, uh, for example, in France, the election, the first round, uh, people have noticed that, you know, Le Pen, uh, because of uh, her paying attention basically to the cost of living, uh, you know, uh, yeah. partly related probably to the inflation and to the high prices of oil and gas. Uh, so do you think there will be a problem in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the public sentiment in terms of uh, whether, you know, people are ready to also sacrifice? Oh, definitely. And I, I think, you know, what I keep on saying is that right now there is strong solidarity with Ukraine. But there will be a moment when people start, as we all do, looking at themselves, you know, what's in it for me? And that's why I think it's very important for European leaders to communicate the price of war. And the price of war is higher inflation, higher food prices, higher energy prices, therefore higher uh, heating prices and higher uh, prices for driving cars. And this will have an impact. You mentioned the French elections. I actually thought that President Macron would ride into the Elysee and the presidency on the back of this war. But Marine Le Pen has been raising the issues of the cost of the war. And I think we'll see a similar type of a pattern in the discussion in the United States and the midterm elections and, of course, then the presidential elections in two years. So these things matter. Important to, com important to communicate the price of war, and that price is high. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, uh, as you said, you know, sanctions, of course, uh, has, uh, I mean, its effects not only on the Russians, but also on the European countries. Uh, but then if you look at the purpose, of course, as you said, uh, is to impose restrictions on the uh, Russian government or the elite or the decision makers. But do you think the sanctions, five rounds of them already, uh, do you think they will produce the, result, result, uh, the desired results? For example, uh, Russia will make a decision probably to withdraw or to lower down its military operation in Ukraine? No, sanctions are all, always only a partial solution, right? And it depends on the scale of the sanctions. I think Russia now understands that it will be isolated and the sanctions will have a tremendous effect on its economy, on its welfare. Uh, and on its living standards. And of course, one of the biggest uh, elements were the freezing uh, of uh, the assets of the Russian central bank, uh, it, 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 its currencies in, in the dollar. Uh, they have an impact on the day-to-day -day lives in Russia. But of course, in Russia, which is a very hierarchical leadership structure, it also then has to hit the governors, it has to hit the oligarchs and the rest of it. I do, however, think, unfortunately, that the only way in which we can get out of this conflict is a military solution. But that military solution comes from Ukrainians only. So sanctions are one part, but providing financial support and military uh, equipment to the Ukrainians is another. So it's, it's a more holistic view, if, you, if, uh, if I may. For the Russians, uh, probably the war is too big to lose. Uh, so obviously, they are not ready you know, to lose in this war. Uh, probably they will also enhance their operation, for example, uh, to try to achieve their target, if not uh, the entire country, uh, let's say uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, Denpas region. Do you think they will make it? It's hard to say. I think there are three options here. One is that Putin withdraws. Two is that Ukraine is somehow split to an eastern flank and then a western flank. And the third one is that Putin basically takes over all of Ukraine. I think the third one is out of the question now. We've seen the military weakness uh, of Russia in conventional warfare. They will not be able to do that. Um, and I also think it's highly unlikely that Putin will draw completely. So therefore, the second solution, though I don't like it, is probably the more realistic one. How it's going to end up, I don't know, but I mean, you know, we are looking at uh, a new Bosnia type of a situation or a completely frozen conflict. Uh, and it's, it's a very unfortunate state of affairs. But this is the reason that I don't see a ceasefire being likely because the interests of President Zelensky and President Putin of Russia and of uh, Ukraine are so far apart. And you ultimately, some say uh, the United States probably will talk to Russia uh, or EU on the NATO level, for example, to talk to Russia to 
I don't know, to establish maybe a new uh, security framework to make sure there is no hot war, for example, in the European continent. Uh, is that a likely scenario? Uh, it, it, it's an idealistic scenario. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that we've gone beyond the point of no return. So if, if you recall, uh, the European st security structure was basically created with the Helsinki Accords in 1975. And the basic idea was that uh, we all have territorial integrity uh, and we are allowed to take our own security political decisions and the landlines of Europe are, are set in stone. Now, of course, Russia has violated that three times since the end of the Cold War, first in Georgia, then with the Crimean Peninsula, and now in the eastern flanks of, of, of Ukraine. Russia always wanted to create a European security structure in its own image, with it at its center. And of course, coming from a small state, I can never let that happen. And the reason is very simple. Russia wants to have spheres of interest, a concert of big powers. It's this sort of nostalgic element of power politics. And we can't have any of that. So therefore, I don't see uh, an imminent new European security structure. I more or less see on one side NATO and the European Union and on the other side Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the future, say, EU-US uh, relationship? Uh, we know uh, militarily, security-wise, obviously the EU has a lot of uh, reliance or dependence on the United States, for example, the ongoing war. And now uh, the European Union has made a strategic decision basically to cut off gradually maybe uh, dependence on the energy security from Russia, probably turn to the United States for LNG, for example. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, are there people who feel like, oh, we probably rely on the U.S. too much, not only militarily, but also energy security? I think what Putin has done is he has revived the transatlantic partnership. It's almost like transatlantic partnership 2.0. A lot of us in Europe were a little bit afraid that uh, the United States would disengage from Europe because of, you know, uh, an emerging sort of tension between China and the United States, and the focus was very much on China. Now the U.S. has been, if not distracted, at least moved away from that, and it's focusing more on, on European security. And this has actually brought Europe uh, and the United States uh, closer uh, to each other, and I think this will, be, this will be continuing now for a few years to come. On that note, we conclude today's show. Many thanks to our distinguished guest, former Prime Minister Stubb, of Finland. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.